Okay, and the topic here will be current approaches in the fitting of amplification in infants and young children. This will be the first lecture in the module encompassing hearing aids and FM for children. Since we're treating infants and children as a special population of those who we fit with hearing aids, it may be worth considering how these pediatric fittings may, adult from, may differ from the uh, more common adult fitting. For those children who were born with hearing loss or develop hearing loss early on in life, in particular those who develop hearing loss or have hearing loss uh, prior to language development, uh, hearing aids are going to play a role in the speech and language development of the child. So for example, inadequate audibility may have a negative impact on speech and language development by creating delays or disorders. And second, ear, the ear canals of children are going to be considerably different from, from adults. They're going to be typically much smaller overall, and that's going to have an impact on the acoustic properties of the ear canal. And third, uh, unlike adult fittings, it won't be the end user, the adult patient himself uh, or herself, who's responsible for maintaining the hearing aids. It'll be the parents or the guardians of that child. We can conceptualize hearing aid fitting in children as being broken down into a framework of, of five categories or five sections. This was originally put together in the mid-90s by a pediatric working group. These sections proceed from in, in chronological order from assessment to hearing aid selection, hearing aid verification, to hearing aid inform information instruction orientation, and then to outcome evaluation. So quite a logical uh, sequence. Assessment, of course, will be where we're determining the degree and configuration and type of hearing loss the child has. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Is it conductive? Is it mixed? Is it sensory neural? Sloping, etc. Selection of the hearing aid, we'll be looking at considering which make and model of the hearing aid to get the child, uh, thinking about things like FM compatibility, what type of ear mold to get for the child, special considerations like a, a child-proof battery door, frequency lowering technology, etc. Verification is a step where you're typically performing really or measures. This may be on the child, him or herself, but it may also be simulated in a test box after you've uh, completed the really or decoupler difference on the child. Then information and instructional stage. This will oftentimes be with parents, but later on down the road it will include the child, him or herself, uh, as the child gradually becomes a greater part, taking a larger role in this. And outcomes evaluations for the child. This can be anything from uh, questionnaires administered to the parent, the child, the teacher. Um, it could be uh, aided speech testing. It can, it can encompass a variety of different, um, different things. So first starting with assessment. We know the assessment procedures uh, and, and the challenges in assessment are considerably different from what we have in an adult population. In terms of very young children, those who are under six months, it may be electrophysiologic assessment in terms of auditory brainstem response testing, um, and potentially also ASSR testing, but primarily ABR. Maybe information may only be uh, obtained at a limited number of frequencies in each year. Uh, and then later on, six months or older, they maybe see VRA testing, so visual reinforcement audiometry. You want to have at least uh, two thresholds per ear, or two minimum response levels per ear uh, for both air and bone conduction. It's important that a child uh, who has unilateral hearing loss is not mistakenly fit uh, bilaterally. And the second key component of assessment um, is going to be ear canal acoustics, uh, really to coupler difference. So this is typically a measurement that we're using to, uh, to transform that converts DBHL in the coupler to uh, DBSPL in the real ear. This is a, a measurement for hearing aid verification that we typically consider optional in most adults. And these aren't the only two components, of course, of audiologic assessment, but these are the two components that play the biggest role in hearing aid fitting for a child. While, while pure tone thresholds for air and bone and the RECD are probably the components that are of most important to creating a uh, successful hearing aid fitting, we know there's going to be several other components to the hearing assessment that are also going to play an important role. Uh, case history, otoscopic inspection, admittance, and diagnostic OAEs. Case history to help uh, find out is there a genetic basis to this. You need to refer for genetic testing. Um, otoscopic inspection to evaluate uh, if there's any abnormalities of the outer ear to refer on to an ENT. 
um, emittance to help help uh, as a cross check in terms of determining if there's a conductive component involved in here. Diagnostic OAEs are very important for um, for uh, helping determine if there's going to be um, there's a cross check for the audiogram, but also is a uh, to differential diagnosis of auditory neuropathy in conjunction with AVR and acoustic reflexes. So because we know children who are between zero to around six months need to be assessed electrophysiologically to determine uh, detection thresholds, uh, we need to talk a little bit about how we can use AVR data and make that into useful data for hearing aid fitting. When we're measuring uh, threshold specific, frequency specific uh, AVR, um, the units of decibels that we're typically using are referenced to NHL. Now right now there is no ANSI standard to define what NHL is, so we typically refer back to um, experts in terms of NHL. Uh, typically normalized hearing level, and you can think of that as the electrophysiologic equivalent to DBHL on the standard audiogram. And if we recall the standard with the standard audiogram, that NHL usually is referenced to um, or the DBHL is usually referenced to adults. Um, NHL is similar vein referenced to adults. So the threshold levels that we get with DBNH or DBNHL for a child are not equivalent to DBHL for a child. So we do need to make a, a correction factor there uh, to convert from DBNHL normalized hearing level to DBEHL estimated hearing level. Again, there are no standards for that correction factor. They may be supplied within the manufacturer's uh, manual. Uh, you may also look for, um, collect your own internal data, or you may also uh, check uh, textbooks or check for some experts' data. Data from Dr. Staples in British Columbia uh, is, has correction factors uh, of 20 dB at 500 hertz, 15 dB at 1,000 hertz, 10 dB at 2,000 hertz, in 5 dB at 4,000 Hz. So because dBNHL typically uh, uh, underestimates uh, hearing sensitivity, we end up subtracting these correction factors from dBNHL to equal dEHL. So if you look at the audiogram over here, if we get dBNHL uh, ABR thresholds if for, uh, say, tone bursts at uh, 500 Hz, if it's 60 dB, it gets corrected to 40 dB EHL. At 60 dB at 1,000 Hz is corrected to 40, 45 dB at 1,000 Hz. Uh, 70 dB NHL at 2,000 Hz is then corrected to 60 dB EHL at 2,000 Hz. And 70 dB NHL is then corrected to 65 dB EHL at 4,000 Hz. It's important to see if the manufacturer already employs the correction factor in there by default in your ABR system or if the expectation is that you will add the correction factor later on. That's critical for you to find out with your ABR system uh, because if you apply this correction factor twice that will, t that will typically uh, uh, overestimate how good the child's hearing is and then you may be under amplifying the child. So when we talk about children that are slightly older who can perform behavioral audiometry, who can perform, say, visual reinforcement audiometry, uh, we typically want ear-specific information, so our preference is not to use the sound field if we can avoid it. So inserts are, are likely what you would prefer to use. Um, some problems in the past with inserts have been uh, inserts that have been too heavy and some causing tension on the insert to pull out. That could have been uh, use of an older, or an older, less popular style insert, technically superior and cheaper, but less popular. The ER5A was used by clinicians for a while, uh, a better earphone overall, but it was, but the the little box it was actually integrated into the um, uh, was was more lateral on the actual earphone, so it was causing it to be dragged down or weighed down more. So the the ER3A, which is the most popular insert earphone out there. You typically have the little transducer box that you clip to the um, child's shirt or the um, could be the mother's shirt, I guess, just depending on the situation. And then the earphones are going in the child's ear. You can see that foam tips are common to use. Another, another common approach would be if the child already has ear molds, uh, then you can, you can take, n instead of coupling the insert earphone, uh, you can couple the child's BTE ear mold. 
there is uh, some controversy about whether or not that's a ideal approach. Uh, the people at DSL say it's, it's a good approach to use, and some of the people at some of the really manufacturers companies don't think that's the best idea, like AudioScan. Um, mainly has to do with uh, measuring an accurate RECD, but I'm not going to get into that here. So we already discussed uh, assessment and the importance of using that correction factor when converting from DBNHL to DBEHL. So let's talk a little bit more about individual ear canal acoustics. We can see that the growth of the child's ear canal was pretty dramatic over the first 10 or so months of life. Extending from uh, ar about 14 millimeters in length uh, shortly after birth to around uh, 20 millimeters or so at 12 months. I think the implication of that is that um, changes in ear canal length would have a uh, corresponding change in ear canal acoustics and that can be d quite dramatic over that first year of life and so it may be uh, more critical to uh, change hearing aid settings more often uh, over that first year. To give you an idea, the degree of variability that we see across children who are under 12 months of age, we can look to some data published by Westward and Bamford. They, they have 29 infants um, that they use to create these 95% uh, uh, range here. I'm sorry, not 95% range. We have the mean data for really a couple of differences as a function of frequency uh, for these children. And then we also have plus or minus one standard deviation. So we can see that um, o with only two standard de deviations, and this wouldn't necessar not necessarily encompass the entire range, maybe uh, closer to 68% uh, or so, the range for children in that sample. We can see that in many areas, particularly at 4,000 hertz, uh, that the decibel difference between uh, b one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean is in excess of uh, 10 decibels, closer to probably around, oh, I would say 12 or 13 decibels there. And if we just pick two random uh, subjects, two subjects from that sample of 29 infants, and we compare their RECDs on the right side here, we can see that they, they can be markedly different, because remember for uh, for the differences that we see between any two subjects, those are uh, differences in amplification characteristics. So we'd have more or less amplification. So we'd be, we'd be over or under, under amplifying a child uh, depending on which direction they stray from the average that we would use otherwise. And just as a reminder, we learned a couple of difference is that uh, measurement that uh, transforms uh, DBHL in the coupler to uh, DBSPL in the ear canal of the real ear. And we'll, we'll talk more about that here. So here's another graphic that would show you the, um, the potential difference between RECD for adults and RECD for infants and toddlers. We can see that this difference can be as great as 20 dB when we look at averages. When we look at the thick pink line for an infant, for an average infant, versus the thick black line for an adult. We can see the general trend for RACD is to rise as a function of frequency so that there's um, a greater difference between the real ear and the coupler at high frequencies than at low frequencies. There are three types of uh, clinical measurements of external ear canal acoustics in general. Um, they all have some uses uh, to some degree, but some are more important than others. Real ear unaided gain, REUG. A real ear to coupler difference, RECD, and real ear to dial difference, REDD. And these are, should be somewhat familiar from previous amplification courses. The real ear unaided gain is essentially the measurement that where we've got um, an external loudspeaker, could be, could be at zero degrees azimuth, and it's, um, and it's, it's uh, sending out a fixed stimulus level and we're measuring the input at the eardrum with the ear unoccluded. The ear is unoccluded in this condition. So we're looking at how the, the pinna and the, um, the head and the torso, how they are causing, um, uh, how they are shaping the, the signal coming from the speaker in front. So how we calculate that would be if we 
if we know the characteristics of the stimulus uh, and we can measure the response at the eardrum we just subtract the the response of the stimulus to obtain really or unaided gain if we have if we have the response if we have the stimulus and the really or unaided gain mixed together that's the really or unaided response so we we know that if we're talking about very high levels like around 60 or 70 db spl we're probably talking about the really or unaided response but if we're talking about much lower levels around um, 0 to 10 db we're talking about really or unaided gain recall that with uh, adults and this looks like it's in a measurement of an adult here that we have our peak for really uh, really ear unaided gain around 3000 hertz so the resonance of the ear canal to give you an idea what real ear unaided gain looks like when we compare an adult and an infant um, you can see that for uh, this the solid line for the infant we can see that the resonance is at a much higher frequency it's probably even uh, higher than we have on the measurement here in comparison to the adult very likely due to the smaller or shorter ear canal for the child creates a higher resonance and it's very possible that the peak would be in excess of the 14 dB we see for an adult so probably higher in frequency and also um, higher in overall amplitude for the peak what, what really ear unaided gain would be important for would be if we were transforming um, if we were if we were concerned with transforming the um, threshold responses uh, from a loudspeaker from a loudspeaker but then that would be not ear specific if we're looking to transforming the the responses from a loudspeaker so um, db dbhl um, to dbspl in the real ear but hopefully we're not going to be too worried about reug because we want frequency specific information onto the RECD, the really ear decoupler difference. Uh, this is going to be the, the difference bet in, um, between dB measured uh, in a coupler, dB, dB uh, measured in a coupler, dBHL, versus uh, the dB SPL measured in the real ear. Because the real ear decoupler difference is a clinical measurement, we're typically talking about insert earphones here. We're typically talking about um, dB SPL measured in a 2 cc coupler. Technically, we could be talking about a 6 cc coupler, which is used for calibration for a, a super oral earphone. It's just that we really don't have 6 cc couplers in the clinic. So this is an occluded response. It's not an unoccluded response like the REUG uh, or REUR. This is going to be having, uh, you typically have a foam insert ear tip in the ear, or it could be a custom ear mold for a child. We've got the real ear aided response. Okay? Not aided, I'm sorry. We have the real ear response, the real ear response portion of it, and then the coupler response. And the difference between the two is the RECD. And down below here we can see the, th the uh, solid line, and below is the um, measured RECD, and that the dashed line is the average RECD. And we can see how those two might be different. Uh, the individual person may deviate from average. If we want to look at how RECDs differ between adults and children, we can look at the data from um, Feigen. Um, and we can see that overall the RECD for children is just much larger than it is for adults across the board, except at the highest frequencies. It's not quite as large of a difference, but RECD much larger for children than for adults. So we essentially don't need to put um, is we don't need to prescribe as great of gain when you have a smaller ear canal that produces uh, larger SPLs. And the third type of transformation to talk about in terms of uh, acoustics would be the real ear to dial difference. The real ear to dial difference is is a great idea but it's not used very much clinically. This could be used both for insert earphones and for super oral earphones, but it would be much more important for super oral earphones. Because as I mentioned before, with insert earphones you can measure an RECD. Can't really do that with super oral earphones. Let's say you let's say instead of using insert earphones on a child, you measure audiometry with uh, super oral earphones because they won't let you put inserts in their ear. Well, you still want to use that data, right? You still want to use that audiometric data, and you still want to make it useful for hearing aid fitting. The problem is, 
a lot of times you're going to have to use an average relier to dial difference. And let me explain what that is. The relier to dial difference is just going to include both your, essentially your RETS full in conjunction with an RECD. It's kind of the combination of those two. As a reminder, the RETS full is just what it's going to take uh, to convert uh, DBHL to DBSPL. It's just that conversion. It's transducer and frequency specific. This takes into account both the RETS full um, and the um, RECD. All right. So it's really what it is, is if you put the probe microphone in the ear canal and you measure what is the SPL in the ear canal when I set my audiometer to a certain level. So you would have the probe microphone in the ear canal with your super oral headphones on. You might present it at like 70 dBHL on the audiometer and then you just measure what is the SPL in the ear canal. So it's a great, a great way to get around um, not having a 60C coupler in the clinic. The problem is most instrumentation does not allow you to use that. Uh, AudioScan used to have it on there, they've dropped it. I checked with Fry, uh, makers of you know the Phonics test box, and they do have it on there it sounds like still. Um, I'm not sure about some other manufacturers, those are the two I checked with. But we can see here, again, we have a measured REDD on the right side, on the figure on the lower right here. We can see um, measured REDD is with the circles, and the uh, dotted is going to be average REDD. You can see how one might be considerably different from the other, uh, emphasizing the importance of measuring that on each individual, in particular on children. Because the RECD is by far the most common type of um, transformation that we measure in a child, let's talk a little bit more how you want to do that. We know there's, there's pretty much three, or s three ways that I can think of, um, three or four ways that you, wanna, um, you could use to insert the probe tube in the ear canal in order to get it at the appropriate insertion depth. Remember, you want to get it deep enough so we can get accuracy measuring the high frequencies which are most susceptible to standing waves. You could use the old bump and pull method. Uh, not really going to go over so well on the kids, I think. Um, you could also use a constant insertion depth. Uh, and that would be fine. Um, you could also, the acoustic method is probably going to be kind of cumbersome to use on a child. Um, or you could just measure measure the probe tube a certain certain length beyond the insert earphone be, beyond the um, uh, the tip of the uh, ear mold. So we'll talk about these average insertion depth methods where you're measuring it with a um, with a ruler for how many millimeters you want to go deep in the ear canal on average. Our goal is typically in general with adults or children we want to get it within about five millimeters of the eardrum. When using an ear mold with a young child, you may want to um, measure, the, measure the probe tube against the ear mold so that the tube goes about three millimeters beyond the termination of the uh, medial sound bore. And then move that little black notch back to the uh, most lateral end of the, the mold corresponding to the intertragal notch. Um, for older children, you may end up wanting to uh, have about five millimeters beyond the sound bore or possibly a little farther than that. You could do something with an I similar with an insert earphone as well, um, but you may actually want to uh, wrap the earphone or ear mold um, in using some saran wrap to couple the probe tube with the uh, either insert earphone or the uh, ear mold so that you don't have to worry about the two pieces falling apart. So there's an example uh, with, it, with it about two to four millimeters beyond the insert earphone tip. You can see a picture below there for uh, how it's being coupled with the um, uh, ear mold. I think another good thing to mention would be um, you. the ideal is to get an RECD on both ears. Okay, If you can't get an RECD on both ears, then you're better off taking an RECD from one ear and using that for both ears. That's probably a better approach than using average data. Um, because we know that the right ear and left ear RECDs are highly correlated, very similar to one another. The main exception would be if there's just some gross abnormality in one ear and not the other, whether it's a TM perforation um, or something unusual like that. The RECD comes into play again here, even when we're conducting just regular audiometry over time. Maybe we're comparing ABR thresholds from when the child was younger to VRA thresholds from when the child was a little bit older. Um, 
and, and so RECDs can come into play there. We want to see, we want to use RECDs to help us figure out if the child's hearing is stable or if it's changing. Because remember that ear canal is changing, and that could have an effect on our preterm thresholds. But we don't know if it's a real change unless we correct for the um, change in the ear canal. So there's, main, there's mainly probably two issues that we, we, we want to use this RECD for. We want to use it to convert HL in the coupler to real ear SPL uh, when working with hearing aids. We also want to convert observed uh, thresholds in HL to equivalent adult HL when comparing audiograms over time. Instead of comparing audiograms over time that I was talking about a moment ago and the converting HL to real ear SPL for hearing aids we were talking about earlier. The RECD can be used for both purposes. So here's a graph that I made here to highlight how we use this information. In particular, and how how um, so we can see that we have DBHL in the coupler on the left. This is the DBHL that we're measuring, say VRA. We have DBSPL there on the right. DBSPL in the real ear. That's what we're working with when we're trying to work with hearing aids for the child. So how do we get there? As I mentioned earlier, and I think we've talked about it in previous classes, there's th we, we need a, a transformation to get there. We can use the real ear to dial difference, which is most applicable with a super oral earphone. Of course, you could do it with an insert earphone, but it's really the only option you have with a super oral earphone. Um, if you're going from DBHL Ray, a 6CC coupler because you're talking about measuring it in a super oral ear phone, you need to convert to DBSBL in the real ear, um, you're probably going to end up using an average real ear to dial difference. And some systems may allow you to measure it, and if you have a system that can do that and you want it and you want it and you're able to do that, fantastic. I'm just saying most systems probably won't let you do that. Most of the time, you're probably working with insert earphones with the children, regardless of whether or not you're, you're coupling the insert earphone to a foam tip or an ear mold. We won't get into that right now. Those are the two ways you can couple the insert earphone. The, you'll have two correction factors. You'll have one, the RETS bowl, and that's, you can look those up in an ANSI table for a given frequency for a given type of uh, transducer. ER3A is usually what we're concerned with. And then you also have your RECD. You can measure it or you can default to the average age uh, age norm for RECD provided by, for example, DSL. Now, you're not typically having to do the math yourself, but you need to know how this works. So DBHL reference to a 2cc coupler, you're going to go ahead and add the RETS full, and that converts it to DBSPL, Ray, 2cc coupler. And then you measure the RECD on the child, and that's going to look at uh, the, me basically measuring SPL in the real ear with a fixed stimulus versus SPL in the coupler, coupler with that same stimulus. And now you add that correction factor on your DBSPL array 2CC coupler. It converts it to DBSPL array the real ear. And remember, the reason you want to measure this whenever you can is because of how much variability there is both over time for that first year of life, but also between individual children within any given age. So just a reminder what RETS bowls might look like for an ER3A. This is a, um, a table that I, I got from an ER3A spec sheet. You can see we've got a variety of frequencies here. What you have is um, occluded ear simulator. Most of us aren't going to use that. Uh, and then HA2 with a rigid tube and HA1. So remember HA2 is the BTE coupler. HA1 is the um, ITE coupler. This is just depending on how it's calibrated. You just select whichever coupler that you're connecting it up with. I know we're not typically doing the calibration, but you take that correction factor on the left-hand side, not the one in parentheses, but on the left-hand side, and you add that to your DBHL value. You can see that using an HA2 with rigid tube coupler at 1,000 hertz, the correction factor is zero. Um, but at 250 hertz, it's 14 dB. So you'd have to add 14 dB on your DBHL threshold at 250 hertz to obtain DBSPL threshold. Again, this is not something you have to do. The system will automatically do this for you, but be aware of, of what I'm talking about and how it is done. Okay, 
So now if we want to take an example where we've got, uh, we've got a child who we, we have a four month old infant and we're trying to, we have ABR data and it's already be con been converted to DBEHL for us. We've already added that correct, uh, added the correction factor to NHL to get EHL. We've already subtracted the correction factor from NHL to get EHL. So we can see that we have, we've obtained these EHL thresholds of 40, 45, 60, and 65 dB EHL across the frequency range here. And if we want to convert that to dBSPL in the real ear, so we can work with hearing aids here, we add our frequency specific insert earphone rest bowl. It's going to be 6, 1, 6, and 2 across the board there. And then we're going to add our measured RECD, ranging from 8 to 23. So we can see that measure RECD is going to be much larger in the high frequencies. And that gives us our DBSPL threshold that we're going to work with with hearing aids. This is how we can do a simulated relay ear measurement in the coupler to begin with. Because we have this information, we can have a reasonably accurate simulation in the coupler where you hook up the hearing aid uh, to the coupler. The only thing it doesn't take into account for really is going to be like venting effects on an ear mold, whether it's unintentional or intentional, um, maybe length of the ear mold as well. Oh, and I guess another thing is microphone location effects. It wouldn't take into account. It will take them account on average if you select BTE. It'll so it won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty close. So again, if we have, if we want to compare s the same child's four-month ABR results with their nine-month behavioral VRA results, um, and say, you know, we see an audiometric change and observed DBHL, but we want to say, you know, is this a real change or is it not a real change? We go through the process we just went through, and we take into account their new measured RECD, and we can find we can see that on that graph on the right, bam, they're matching up perfectly. That wasn't a real change; it was an artifact. It was a change in RECD masquerading as a change in audiometric threshold. Now it's time to talk about something a little bit different here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we're talking about the same thing here. I'm just going to have a table to show you exactly how we did the math there from that previous graph. Because pr in the previous graph, we're comparing uh, two audiograms over time. So how we do that um, is we're going to take the measured RECD for the child at four months versus the child at nine months. We have to have both of those. We have to make sure that we measure the RECD at both points in time. And then we also have our average adult RECD. Well, that doesn't change. It's always the same. That's just what we look up in a table. Then we have our DBEHL threshold, so our AB ABR threshold that we've already converted to EHL. So all that we're doing here is we're going to take our, our DBEHL thresholds, and we're going to um, add our measured RECD, and then we're going to subtract our average adult RECD, and that gives us our equivalent adult HL threshold. Okay, so it does, and then we do the same thing with our VA, VRA results, our DBHL VRA results. Add the measured RECD minus the adult average RECD, and that gives us our equivalent adult HL thresholds. And by doing that, by doing that, we can make an apples to apples comparison, like we have on that graph on the right. So that is the same thing. So if you work if you work in pediatric audiology in a hospital, this is this is a really critical thing to to do. Okay, so this is a uh, these figures are, are taken from Legato back in 2005. This is going to show us the um, variability, kind of a spread of RECD at 500 hertz and 4,000 hertz across age and across individuals here. We can see that the 500 hertz RECD doesn't seem to systematically change over over the first um, first few years of life, beyond first few years of life, I suppose. Um, uh, in the 4,000 hertz RECD, typically gets lower, uh, decreases over that first first um, year and a half or so of life. But what we see is the issue here for both of these, af besides the 4,000 hertz for the first year and a half, the issue isn't really as much about systematic age-related changes as, as, as much about inter-individual variability. There's just a huge spread here, so that if you don't measure the RECD, there's a great potential for error. If you look at the spread here, say at 60 months even, spread here is, um, 
I would say, you know, probably 12 to 13 dB. And let's look over here at 4,000 hertz. If we look over here at, uh, I don't know, 40 months or so, a little about 40 months here, our spread is going to be, you know, over 10 dB as well. So that's, that's, that's not like getting 10 dB wrong in the hearing thresholds because that's not going to have as great of an impact on 10 dB in hearing thresholds. It doesn't mean 10 dB in gain because we're not doing 1 dB of gain for every chain, 1 dB change in threshold. You know, remember the half gain rule? We're kind of talking more about that roughly. So we're talking about um, if we have a 10 dB error, on our RECD, it could be it could be almost not this isn't perfect, but it could be kind of like equivalent to having a 20 dB area on the audiogram. So that's big. Could be the difference between audibility of soft speech and not. Okay, so let's do a summary here. We've got audiometry with earphones. Okay. That's what we want to use, audiometry with earphones. If we do audiometry with super oral earphones, and if you don't have real ear dial to difference capabilities on your real ear system, which uh, you probably won't, then you have the potential of making some big errors. Basically, the difference between the, the um, average real ear to dial difference and the, the uh, child's measured real ear to dial difference, which can be pretty large. In terms of the NHL to EHL correction, so when we measure frequency-specific ABR thresholds and we want to convert that into estimated hearing level, um, if we forget to correct this at all, we're going to be over-amplifying the child. If there's already a correction in the ABR software and we add it again, we'll be under-amplifying the child. So this can go both ways. So just pay careful attention to that NHL, EHL correction. Understand what the ABR equipment is doing. Understand how your real ear verification system handles that information. An RECD, you know, that makes a big difference. A lot of these systems are going to default to an uh, adult average RECD. You need to, at very least, use child averages, but your best bet is to measure it. Remember, measuring in one ear and using it for both ears is better than just using age, rela age, age norm data to begin with. Okay, let's talk about selecting hearing aids. When we're selecting hearing aids for kids, these are, the th these are our objectives here. We want audibility of soft speech. We know that won't always be a realistic option, depending on the degree of loss. If they have a severe to profound loss, we probably can't make soft speech audible. But for a lot of kids, we can make soft speech audible. We want to avoid distortion of speech, uh, of loud speech in particular, because that's where it's most likely going to interact with your MPO. We want to make sure your MPO isn't set too low, so that loud speech is causing the aid to saturate. We want to give the child as broad of a bandwidth as possible, as wide of a frequency bandwidth as possible, uh, so that we can have audibility of fricatives. We also want to make sure that the hearing aid we're choosing and the setup we're choosing is, to some degree, future-proof. We don't want to get a hearing aid, uh, say a, a mini BTE, that just barely meets the, the needs for the child right now, because we know we're going to have to bump up that gain down the road, even if hearing doesn't change, because the, the, the ear is going to get larger, meaning that, that that voltage, that SPL, is not going to go as far. We're going to need more voltage output to get the same SPL at the eardrum, because the cavity is getting smaller. Remember Boyle's Law. Okay, let's talk about prescriptive algorithms now. This is going to refer to what we want for gain or for output. You know, it now has historically talked about gain. DSL has historically talked about output. Um, with now, we can convert it to output. No big deal, really. With children, we're more concerned about output at the eardrum. Uh, but realistically, you could talk about it in either way. We're talking about the gain or output for... Uh, for a defined input level in a defined, a defined spectrum of the input level. So whether it's conversational speech, we need to agree on the speech stimulus and the level. And for that, for that stimulus, we want to have a certain gain or output with the hearing aid in order to achieve certain sensation levels or certain SPLs at the eardrum. 
how do we do that? How do we how do we get our prescriptions? We know that we get our prescriptions, or not get them. We um, obtain our our actual gain or output values by inputting our pure tone detection thresholds. All contemporary prescriptions use pure tone detection thresholds. I know in the past there have been a few who have used some kind of loudness scaling. Well, nobody's doing that anymore, really. We're all using pure tone detection thresholds for an NAL DSL cam. Um, most of these methods, these DSL and NAL methods, uh, they're, they're taking into account audibility or uh, speech intelligibility, and they're all constrained by loudness, not, not uh, allowing extreme loudness to occur uh, so that the hearing aid setting is rejected. Okay, let's talk about generic versus manufacturer prescriptive algorithms. Generic prescriptions, pretty straightforward. These are intended for use with any hearing aid. DSL, NAL, used for any nonlinear hearing aid. Typically, there's a lot of documentation in the literature on them. There's going to be easy to find papers and academic journals that describe these procedures as far as, as how they're derived. Um, and th there's going to be the evidence base supporting the use of these algorithms, saying that they're consistent with preferred listening levels. They're going to achieve certain speech intelligibility goals. These are going to be things like NAL NL1, NAL NL2, DSL IO, which is DSL4. DSL MIO, which is DSL 5, and CAM 2, which is the uh, successor to CAMEC and um, CAMREST. The DSL and NAL algorithms are typically licensed both by the um, hearing aid manufacturers to include in their software and by the real ear manufacturers to include in their software. In contrast to generic prescriptions, we have manufacturer prescriptions as well. These manufacturer prescriptions are intended only for the hearing aids, um, the individual hearing aid they were made for. So each hearing aid company will make their own hearing aid prescription. Um, they might go by the names Estat for Starkey, Micon Fit for Siemens, Adaptive Phonak Digital for Phonak. Um, you know, mo and we've also got some probably for I believe for Resound and for um, Oticon. Most of the major companies have these. Widex, they all have them. And so these are typically not nearly as well documented. You might be able to find a little technical paper on it, but the evidence base behind it is pretty scant. You don't really find any academic papers saying that the, showing that these are as good or even as good or better than NAL or DSL or generic algorithms. You only typically find a little bit of data from the manufacturers on them. You definitely don't find data for children on these uh, manufacturers' algorithms. Another thing to note is these algorithms may change over time, and you may not know it. They're not going to communicate that with you. So we know NAL NL2 is NAL NL2, but ESTAT in one Starkey hearing aid um, may be different than ESTAT in the new generation of Starkey hearing aids, and we just may never know. I want to share some data with you regarding a little, um, a little study published in the Hearing Journal in 2008 that Seawald and colleagues from the um, from University of Western Ontario put out. They took five of the big hearing aid manufacturers and, and they programmed it with a variety of audiograms. This particular one is a um, gently sloping moderate to moderate severe loss. They hooked it, they hooked it up in a um, in the 2cc coupler, in the HA2 coupler for an audio scan verifit and went to do the simulated relay measurements and they were just measuring based on the, the manufacturer's uh, algorithm what the default setting there was given given it was set up for like a six month old child and I think they used the average RECD for a six month old in the um, the audio scan relay system. What we can see is a wide range and measured output in the uh, coupler uh, for for each of these manufacturers. Now there, there's, uh, there's actually two factors that come into play here. We know even if we're selecting NAL, even if we're selecting NAL or DSL, it will not typically meet NAL or DSL all the time when, we, when we're hooking up to it a coupler anyway. So there's that, that factor, but there's also going to be the differences between manufacturers and their own prescription algorithms. Um, really what this is telling me is how incredibly important doing real ear and measuring an RECD and doing real ear is on a child in general and, um, and verifying to NAL or DSL prescriptions. Then we can see here for those same prescriptions and those same manufacturers and the same um, what we can see is these are uh, predicted speech intelligibility index values for nine different audiograms. 
and we can see basically for soft average and loud you can see for loud there's not a huge difference well you know duh because there's a lot more gain or, uh, because loud is a much greater level input so uh, inaudibility is not much as much of an issue uh, for soft speech that's really where it hits home here soft speech is very critical for children to be able to hear and you can see that for some of these audiograms there might be as much as you know over a 20 percent uh actually greater than a 20 percent difference maybe 30 percent difference in some of these audiograms look at look at h uh look at i audiogram h and i for soft speech and panel a um, as far as the difference in si sii values for these manufacturers so do recds do real ear for children you can do it in the test box so as long as you have an recd measurement Okay, so let's talk about how NAL NL1 and DSL IO, aka DSL4, how they compare with one another. In 2010, there were a series of papers that were published in the International Journal of Audiology that outlined a collaborative study conducted by University of Western Ontario in conjunction with National Acoustic Laboratories. They wanted to see how their two prescriptions fared in uh, both Australian and Canadian children in a uh, crossover type study where ch each child would get experience with the other prescription for a certain period of time. It was double blind, so the children did not know which prescription they had in their AIDS, and the clinicians involved in the study did not know which prescription each child had in their AIDS. They measured RECDs for each kid, and on average, there was about a 7 dB difference in gain between, uh, at 70 dB input levels between the two prescriptions. Each child was, uh, had an 8-week trial for each prescription, and they swapped to the other one for another 8 weeks. They looked at loudness ratings for these prescriptions. They looked at speech and quiet measures aided. They looked at real world ratings. They, they found a couple things. They found that overall, for preference for NAL versus DSL, Australian children preferred NAL, Canadian children preferred DSL. Does that mean we need different prescriptions for different children in the world? Probably not. It probably means that climatization had a big effect here. So those Australian children with hearing loss had been previously used NAL in the past, and Canadian children had used DSL in the past, and so that had a big impact on their overall preference. I think that gives us an idea of uh, that there is some flexibility in terms of what we can give a child. But, but I think the more important thing here was that overall children prefer DSL for certain situations and NAL for other situations. They, DSL typically provided greater audibility overall, had greater gain, and they preferred DSL for speech and quiet, soft speech, and speech from behind, but they, they picked NAL for those noisy, reverberant, or loud environments. So maybe it's not that one is markedly better than the other, but each of them was better at a different thing. Okay, more recently, uh, Ching and colleagues at NAL compared NAL and DSL prescriptions for um, for children from basically birth to three years of age, and they wanted to see if there was any difference in outcomes for these children by three years of age when they didn't have any effect of acclimatization. So these children were randomly assigned to either a DSL group or an NAL group. It was typically NAL NL1 versus DSL IO, aka DSL4. But later on, about half the DSL kids ended up in um, DSL-5, DSL-MIO when it came out. And none of the children actually ended up in NAL, NL-2 by the time the study concluded, but they did after afterward. They were updated into newer prescriptions. So we're kind of comparing NAL, NL-1 to DSL a little bit more globally. What they were measured on in terms of outcomes is they were measured uh, in terms of uh, language, speech production, and functional outcome measures like questionnaire type measures for auditory behaviors. Um, there were about 100 subjects in each group, uh, and that wasn't an exact number, but about 100 subjects in each group. And the researchers found that really overall, um, there was no differences by three years of age. There was no differences between the two groups in language. There were no differences between the two groups in speech production. And there were no differences between the two groups in functional performance. So overall, NAL versus DSL in these young children to, from birth to three really didn't have any big difference in functional outcomes. Okay, so once you pick the, the appropriate prescription that you're going to use for for the child, NAL, NL2, DSL, MIO, your call, then it's time to move on and enter all this data we have into your verification system. 
audio scan verifits are typically or audio scan products in general are some of the most popular in North America but you certainly may have another brand something by Fry something by Medrex um, in any case you're probably going to want to use output display rather than a gain display for children and your system may ask for things like hearing thresholds uh, make sure to pay close attention to the NHL EHL HL distinction age of the child to be fitted, type of transducer, we're using an insert earphone, we're using a super oral earphone, we're using an insert earphone coupled to a foam tip or an ear mold, those all matter. Um, are you using measured or predicted RECD values? What type of hearing aid are you fitting? It, that, that doesn't really matter if you're um, doing it on the ear of the child, but if you're actually doing it in the test box, like a simulated real ear measurement, that'll, that'll um, take into account mi microphone location effects. So you want to get all that information into your system. This is a display that you might see on an audio scan system where we can see the, uh, the circles represent the right ear uh, unaided thresholds. Um, the crosses, uh, the larger crosses, represent targets for conversational speech. The small crosses above it represent targets for MPO. And the asterisks above that represent average loudness discomfort levels generated from hearing thresholds that were input. The the shaded region in the middle represents the, um, the unaided speech spectrum for probably conversational speech. And after you're ready to verify the hearing aids, um, and after you have verified the hearing aids, you may want to consider some of the special features your hearing aid may have and what you want to do with those, if you want to activate those or not. Probably the particular signal processing feature that's received the most attention in recent years in terms of children has been frequency lowering. Frequency lowering technologies are available in an increasing number of products now more than ever. Uh, but in terms of the evidence base to support them, typically I've only seen this for really two implementations of two technologies, nonlinear frequency compression, specifically the um, technology used in the Phonak and Unitron products, probably has the strongest evidence base behind it. Not, it's not, does, doesn't have show uh, terribly strong outcomes in general, either neutral outcomes or weak positive benefit in terms of increased um, ability to identify plurals or fricatives. Uh, there, are, there is a little bit of data as well supporting the use of frequency transposition in particular, though that, that's uh, used in wide X's hearing aids. Uh, other brands out there have their own frequency lowering strategies, Starkey, Bernafon, uh, using some atypical approaches, and I think GN Resound just came up with a linear frequency compression. Uh, Siemens has a nonlinear frequency compression, uh, which is probably similar to Phonax. Uh, but for, so for many of those, the Starkey, Bernafon, and uh, Resound approaches, I think it still remains quite unclear how beneficial those can be for children. So I'd probably stick with something that has uh, some evidence available for it with some of the Phonak, Unitron, Widex products, maybe even the Siemens products. In terms of noise reduction, um, I think there is, in, in, in the beginning, there was a lot of concern regarding noise reduction, any potential negative benefits it might have in terms of children, but I think recent, recent evidence has showed a positive effect in terms of um, maintain, maintaining audibility and improving comfort for, for children in a variety of situations. Uh, same thing is true with directional microphones. For quite some time, there was concern about that. Um, but for uh, directionality, it is for school-age children, there's been shown to be benefits in the classroom. So some of those features like noise reduction, directionality may not be, you may not want to activate those until the child is, is older, possibly school age. Um, FM compatibility is another issue. Um, if, if you're going to use FM compatibility, you probably want to look at your, figure out how your particular manufacturer is going to handle that. Um, sometimes, say for example, Phonak, as soon as you plug in the FM uh, boot into the device, it'll deactivate any automatic features on there. So you might carefully consider and, and explore with the manufacturer exactly how their FM mode works in relation to any automatic features. I think it's pretty, it, can, it goes without saying, for young children, BTE is the style to go with. I know there was um, one manufacturer not too long ago that was recommending a right BTE for, for babies, and I guess that's the only exception to the rule. Um, that doesn't sound like a great idea to me, but there is a little bit of evidence to support that it, it can work. 
Um, but B t more traditional BTEs are typically the way to go for children. School-age children, you may consider transitioning over into a, a right RIC BTE, possibly even a custom aid, but you're probably going to have the least problems with BTEs in terms of durability, um, minimizing acoustic feedback issues, uh, greater flexibility in terms of gain, uh, greater capabilities in terms of accepting uh, FM systems, uh, I know there are some smaller products that maybe have wireless compatibility where you can you can put an FM device on the Bluetooth accessory like the Siemens Minitech or the um, Phonak Pilot or I believe Oticon's newest streamer might have uh, access to that as well. Um, pediatric sized ear hooks, you want to make sure to order those. Hopefully they'll send them to you along with it, but you probably want those. They'll fit better over the child's ear. Um, tamper resistant battery doors for the very young kids so the battery can't be swallowed in inadvertently. Deactivating some of the advanced features we already talked about that may not be relevant for you. Figuring out with your manufacturer how the FM FM options are going to work, and picking a, um, of course, picking a colors that the children are more more likely to like, both for the BTE aid, but in particular for the ear molds as well. Okay, so another advantage of uh, performing relier measurements with the output approach is that when you view an output, you can typically display this speechgram or this SPLogram format where you can look at the relationship between hearing threshold, loudness, discomfort levels, um, soft, average, and loud speech, um, etc. And so we can see in this particular graphic that uh, soft, average, and loud speech are meeting targets. We can see audibility is achieved uh, across the entire frequency spectrum of interest for both average and loud speech, whereas soft speech, it's up until around 4,000 hertz, and then it drops off to some degree, or we don't really know if that's audible above 4,000 hertz because there's no threshold there. But we, we, can, we, can we can visualize the, uh, the range of the residual dynamic range, and we can see how it's, uh, our speech stimuli are able to be compressed inside that range. We can see that our LDLs are meeting our targets, not exceeding our loudness discomfort levels. And more importantly, we can see when these, when these are not meeting targets, so we know how to adjust them in this framework. Typically, odd, a soft speech will be um, around 50 to 50, 55 dB SPL. Uh, average speech will be between around 60 and 65. And um, loud speech will be around 70 to 75, maybe 80 dB SPL. So your exact opinion of which levels to use may vary. I use 55, 65, and 75, um, but opinion may vary on that one. With this view, you can also um, not just look at the average, the RMS spe uh, RMS um, levels for across frequency for soft, average, and loud inputs. You can also view it with the entire speech spectrum here, so that 30 dB dynamic range of, um, in order to see where the peaks and the valleys of speech are. So we can see across this entire dynamic range that even the full 30 dB range is audible across for most frequencies. And and then you can all, you, more importantly, you can also see if um, the peaks of speech, or loud speech in particular, are going to interact with your MPO, and that would cause saturation for loud inputs. You can also see, for example, um, you might be concerned from time to time if your target, your tar like for more severe losses, if your targets fall below your thresholds or just right on your thresholds. And then what you'll see there is you could be uh, comforted to some degree when you look at this 30 dB dynamic range of speech where the peaks may be audible. It may not be full audi audibility of the entire 30 dB dynamic range of each frequency, but you may have, say, 12 or 15 or 18 dB of audibility there. That's all, I've, that's all I've got for this section here. Um, I'll have some more lectures posted on hearing aid orientation and FM fittings next week.